You are listening to Over and Back's Basketball Mysteries of the 1970s. Today's mystery is, who is to blame for the punch? Hey, this is Jason. You're listening to the Over and Back podcast, and I am here. Joining me again is Adam Cribbley. Adam, welcome back to the show, sir. Thanks for having me, Jason. And uh, there's a quote from Mel Daniels from Loose Balls that I think really sort of sums up the idea of the fighting culture in the in pro basketball, the NBA, in this case, particularly the ABA at the time. It came down to the fact that guys were playing for their lives. Intimidation was a big part of it. If you were a man and had any pride in yourself and wanted to be respected, you had to fight. It was that simple. And Daniels, of course, famously uh, told the story of having 78 fights in 78 games as a rookie and being part of a rough and tumble Indiana Pacers team in the in the ABA that it was the great dynasty of the league and then in their intimidation their fighting was certainly part of it slick leonard encouraged that of it you know whenever there was a fight everybody had to be out there and everybody had to defend themselves and you know I, I do think that this you know fighting culture in the NBA and how worries of it really started to manifest themselves in the 1970s and specifically the Rui Tomjanovich Kermit Washington punch that um unfortunately caused serious injuries to Chandranovich and, and changed the face of the league, changed the face of how fighting, fighting was viewed in the league and changed how it was penalized, was part of a huge sort of how the NBA was viewed at the time and how it, fighting was viewed becoming a, a, a blacker league and uh, you know how racism is tied into all of that. And uh, a fascinating subject, but I, I do think the exploration of kind of the evolution of this fighting culture is worth some exploration. No, absolutely. And I think you're, you hit on some, some important points here is that it's, you have to understand the, the racial component of it as well as the, the violent component of it and the, the, the culture and history of basketball to that point that it pretty much, if not, um, you know, emphasized or, or, or celebrated violence and at least accepted it as part of the game. And this is going to be a, a transition in that. Yeah. It, you know, and in the, you know, in, in the forties and fifties, you know, the initial generation of NBA players, uh, there's, there's a anecdote from tall tales, the other great Terry Pluto book about the early, um, NBA, um, where it says there was an infamous game between New York and Baltimore on March 26th, 1949. The Knicks won in overtime 103.99 to win the first round of the playoffs. Sound exciting? And then he talks about how there were 100, exactly 100 personal fouls, three fist fights, blood on the court, took three hours to play, and how the the game was bogged down by a tremendous amount of physical play, of violence, how uh, you know, every team had at least one enforcer, and how the league was, you know, these are a bunch of guys who were World War, War II and then later Korea vets. You know, these were, you know, tough and rumble guys who like to drink beer and like to fight. And how that was very much an initial part of the NBA culture, first as it's a exclusively a white game and then later as it becomes an integrated game. And, and how um, black players, especially initially in those first four or five years uh, before... Um, Russell and Elgin Baylor and will come along how the black players were kind of um, put into this, um, you know, enforcer role of, um, you know, they were there to you know be the tough guy to play defense, to block guard and rebound and, and, and not really do anything more than that. You're right. And I think a lot of it has to do with at the time there's, you know, the fifties and sixties, there's, it's, you know, it's, early civil rights era, there's there's kind of a fascination by white fans, and most of the people that are going to these games are white fans, in in the African-American body and physique and physicality that it's almost, you know, it's, it's almost uh, in some ways why people go to a horror film. They know there's going to be, you know, they know they're, no, they're going to be scared and they're, they're going to be um, threatened and 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 that was in some ways the the fascination with these African American players is they're they're not the superstars of the team uh, until like you said the Elgin Baylors and Bill Russells come along instead they're it's almost a sideshow where you go in part for the violence and um, and the physicality of it and so I yeah it's 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 really a an interesting time in that regard yeah and, and jim tucker talks about that in a great gq piece on the first uh group of african-american players in the nba 
Um, and basically a lot of the early black players, you know, they, they dealt with such serious career consequences, unsure of their roles, you know, dogged by the perception that they were merely role players because they, um, you know, stood out. And, um, and of course, you know, the, 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 there was certainly a amount of physical play, but then again, you know, there was probably, there were, I'm sure, a lot of situations where, um, you know, the black players you c- could do a certain amount physically, but probably, you know, a, a a black player beating up a white player in a lot of the uh, NBA arenas was not going to go over very well. Oh, no, absolutely not. And that was where the line was drawn is it was almost the uh, the black players were allowed to fight one another. But, you know, once you start to to, to have interracial fighting, then that was that was definitely frowned upon at the time. Yes. And, and then one sh- showing a sea change of that. In 1966, there is the Willis Reed fight against the Los Angeles Lakers, where he almost beats up half of the Lakers team. This bench clearing brawl, you know, Reed knocks down, you know, Lakers players. I think I think both black and white in that situation. There's there's a YouTube clip of um of this. I forgot to review the exact particulars before we did this podcast, but it's it's a pretty well known situation and kind of demonstrates a you know one Willis Reed and you know establishing his toughness his physicality and, and i don't you know i'm not, not saying he was necessarily looking to prove something by going on that fight but the fact that you know the culture of basketball where you know th- this sort of thing was um happening because of this you know emphasis on physical play and this emphasis on um you know um needing to you know prove yourself your your toughness you know kind of led to uh, some of this but also opened up you know he, he's Willis Reed is you know, he's going after everybody he's not he, he's not necessarily as restrained as he would have been had this been you know, 10 years before oh absolutely and I think that it's you know it's no coincidence that this has taken place in the in the mid to late 60s where you have the you know i mentioned the rise of civil rights this is kind of the era of you know malcolm x and this uh notion of black power i mean willis reed is is in the midst of this fight two years before the famous black glove fist being raised at the 1968 mexico olympics and so this is a time when you definitely start to have african-american men especially standing up for standing up for themselves and one way to display this masculinity is by by fighting and and willis reed i'll tell you that after that that fight you know no one was messing with him anymore he uh he he beat up enough lakers that they weren't gonna you know they weren't they weren't gonna question or test his uh, his manhood again so and that way he you know he succeeded sure sure there's a really interesting um, looking back on it. It's pretty famous um, Sports Illustrated profile of enforcers from October of '77. I think six weeks or so before the uh, before the actual punch. It profiles a, a, a basically a six enforcers uh, of the league: uh, Maurice Lucas, Kermit Washington, Calvin Murphy, Dennis Autry, Bob Lanier, and Daryl Dawkins. Um, other than Autry, all these guys are black. Um, uh, Calvin Murphy is five nine and one sixty five, but is a he is um, he's muscular. He's he's a he's really strong, scrappy guy. They they get into the sort of in depth with him. Um, the other guys are um, you know big and strong and African American, and um, certainly uh, they're not afraid to talk about how the looks of them you know factor into their intimidation while sort of comparing to uh dennis autry who is the he was the only white guy who described him as having the off-court demeanor of a puppy and his blue eyes twinkle innocently when he says why would i hit a guy for no reason while you know describing the um the physical attributes of the uh, uh of the black players and sort of not necessarily considering them menacing as people but certainly using their looks as a as a factor into their menace well, there there are two really interesting things in this article. So one uh, that you touch on is that Dennis Autry is a I I would read it as kind of a an ornery, overgrown Dennis the Menace. Yes. So he's he's getting into trouble, and you just kind of you know, oh that's just you know that's just Dennis Autry, and people will kind of shake their heads. And um, but the other and and the other point is that you know not only is Dennis Autry pretty well stereotyped here, but the uh, really the only person to uh, play down. Or downplay their their roles and enforcers, Kermit Washington. The other the other four guys that are that are highlighted here in various ways either kind of brag about their reputation. Calvin Murphy's pretty proud of the fact that he's never lost a fight in the league. Um, you know, Daryl Dawkins and Maurice Lucas had just famously uh, uh, squared off in the the NBA Finals the year earlier when they 
they go at each other and kind of do an old style, you know, put your Dukes up fight in the NBA finals on national TV. Um, and then, uh, You've got uh, uh, Bob Lanier, who's who's huge and um, and powerful, and and that he knocked an opponent out once, and that no one picks on him anymore. I mean, so you just have these different, but but you have the white player Dennis Autry, the Dennis the Menace, and then you've got Kermis Washington, almost the uh, the reluctant enforcer. Like he realizes what his role is, but he wants to be more than that, and he he's you know kind of a pull himself up by his bootstraps kind of kid from. Uh, who'd gone to American University, a a very much a self-made player. And so to me, the two takeaways are that, yeah, there's very much a racialized component in, in, um, you know, almost almost writing off Dennis Autry's violence. And then the the one person who doesn't want to be identified as an enforcer is, of course, the one that we're going to forever link to violence in the NBA in the 70s. Yeah. And um, it also goes through the history of some of the other enforcers, talking about uh, Bob Branham with the Celtics in the early 50s. Uh, then Jim Lostikoff uh, replacing him. Other guys who are mentioned are Walter Dukes, Andy Johnson, Tom Hoover, Al Adels, Gus Johnson, Luke Jackson, Wayne Embry, Johnny Green, and Sweetwater Clifton. So, so guys of the 50s and uh, 60s. Um, I, uh, actually, mostly black players in that sense. There's a few white players sure. listed there, but actually mostly uh, black players. Um, also also mentions the Will Street fight as well and, and describes that in pretty good detail. And uh, says that there were 41 fights that happened in the 77 season. Autry talks about, you know, he's, he's felt obligated to fight, but ever since they put in the $10,000 fine, I don't know how obligated I am. So there had not yet been suspensions for um, for fighting, that, or at least not significant suspensions, maybe a game or two, but not. But there, that was not a, a usual tactic. They would obviously, you should generally be ejected from the game, but um, you know, so it was the first time, you know, that this, this, this survive, the, the fine was actually a fairly severe penalty because there was a an element of fear over, you know, that fighting was taking over the game. And not coincidentally, it's also a time in which there is a fear among, um, you know, many white fans that, that, you know, too many black players are, um, are, are taking over the game. Well, this is becoming, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, this is also a time when not only do you have the leagues about 75% African American at this point, but you also have at the same time, you know, a little earlier in the decade, the rise of the black exploitation films that are, they're celebrating, um, you know, African Americans, young African American males taking it, you know, sticking it to the man and the uh, shaft and, um, the idea of, uh, you know, celebrating pimps and, and drug pushers and, uh, and, and, you know, frankly, you know, strong black men. Um, and so this is, you know, this is all kind of taking place at the same time. The league's becoming more black. The, the, the African-American, um, the, the mindset of African-American masculinity is more, uh, uh, is more celebrated. And so this is all kind of coming about in, you know, uh, and, and they publish this article and it, the timing couldn't be worse because of course, you know, the, the SI is, is, uh, making light in some ways of enforcing, uh, but then we have, of course, the 77-78 season. You know, we, we alluded to at the beginning talking about Mel Daniels and the ABA fighting culture. And I kind of want to get into that contribution of before we get into the actual um, you know, incident itself. But um, you know, some of the guys that, that are talked about in Loose Balls and other sources, remember the ABA, you know, Cliff Hagen, who got into was a, uh, you know, a 50s and 60s great, was traded for uh, Bill Russell famously and um, great player for the Hawks. We talked about him in um, a previous uh uh, Hawks Celtics rivalry episode, and um, and then he uh, when he was he was the player coach with Dallas returned to basketball after a year off and uh, would get into uh, all these kinds of fights, including a really famous uh, encounter where the the biggest. A crowd his team had ever entertained was on a kids' day on a Sunday afternoon, and he um, punched out uh, less big game Hunter, uh, who had elbowed him repeatedly, uh, landed three punches before Hunter knew what had in him. Down he went. Management was basically said, "Hey, you know, we you, you can't do this. You can't keep fighting this." Uh, eventually, he would uh, he he started to play less and would wear stop wearing his shorts under his warm ups just to resist the temptation to uh, to go into the game and fight. So um, he he was a guy who was of course also portrayed as like the most gentle guy almost ever and a really nice guy off the court, but just when he got on the court was just mean and fearsome and you know incredibly um, <laughs> vicious and wild. Well, and some of the best parts of Blue Balls are those stories of, of you know, the, the enforcers in the ABA. Was it uh, Brisker and was uh, John Brisker and was the other one Jabali? Warren yes. Jabali? Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that I mean, uh, Terry Pluto spends a lot of time and, and the interviews he conducts, uh, those, those ex-players and, and coaches spend a lot of time talking about just how fantastically, um, or, you know, how good of players those were, but, uh, but really celebrating their, their fighting and that you know, teams were just scared to play them because of how physical and violent they were. Yeah, there is a uh, John Brisker, in addition to his love of fighting, was famous for carrying a gun. And then there, in the 1971 Pittsburgh Media Guide, uh, Brisker is featured in a Mexican sombrero with a pair of six shooters holstered to his hips. So they even played into that image. There was um, he, he was involved in fist fights with uh, Wendell Ladner, Joel Caldwell, and Ron Boone. The later re- require the latter two requiring facial reconstructive surgery. In November of 71, in Salt Lake City, there was a John Brisker Intimidation Night where the stars put a pro boxer, Ron Lyle, on the cover of the program and then also had uh, other boxers, uh, Don and Gene Fulmer, Rex Lane, and T- Tony Doyle in the crowd to uh, to get uh, Brisker to behave himself, which he did that night, which is just a, just an incredible uh, promotion of all things. And then there's um, one other one where um, Brisker was um, – went up to the league commissioner, Jack Dolph, during the All-Star game and demanded his bonus right after the game was done. Uh, Dolph actually reached into his own wallet and paid Brisker $300 on the uh, spot. So, um, uh, yeah, Brisker was eventually a guy who uh, went to the NBA and then was just was out of basketball just because he, even though he had so much talent, just his wild behavior was uh, – you kept him out of the league. Um and um, Wendell Ladner, another guy, as we mentioned, was a guy who you fought with um, Brisker, uh, was known for you know getting into there's a famous um, Brian Taylor and George Carl fight from the 76 Nets Spurs playoff series known as the Easter Day Massacre. So, yeah, all of these stories of I mean, it's part of the outlaw image of the league. And it's celebrated. I mean, really, I mean, you know, um, there's a certain amount of violence that or a certain amount of distance from violence that we're able to, you know, celebrate and be part of this like exciting thing in the in the league where but when it goes to, you know, a point that we're uncomfortable with, obviously, then it's sort of decried and, you know, it, it's a you know, it's a scourge upon the NBA. It's really interesting how the violence in the ABA and the violence in the NBA from roughly the same period are sort of viewed in popular culture because in one view one way it's viewed as part of the charm of the aba and in the other hand it's viewed as a scourge of the nba caught a an element that was causing the nba to turn off a, a bunch of fans you know right around the same time i don't even know that it was the fighting as much as the the physical play and you know anybody that's watched basketball well, I, I won't say anyway, but I, I would guess that most people enjoy a more free-flowing game that's not all fouls and foul shots and grabbing and clawing and, you know, Detroit Bad Boys Pistons fans aside, that that's just more – it's a more uh, fan-friendly, viewer-friendly game. And so I think that not only is it the it's the, it's the, the punching and the outright fights that are, that are uh, turning people all off, but also the fact that the games are just drawn out. I mean, you mentioned a three-hour game, 100 personal fouls. I mean, that sounds miserable. And so I'm sure that, that it wasn't only a reaction to fighting as much as just the, the slowdown that the violence uh, created. Yeah, as we talked about, you know, the, uh, the league – had instituted increased penalties for fighting. Uh, the first big test of that uh, heading into the 78 season was, I, I believe, the first game of the season where um, Kent Benson, who was a rookie from Indiana, had um, elbowed uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar in the uh, stomach. So Kareem uh, walloped him with uh, one punch to the uh, face, knocking him down. And then Kareem ended up breaking his hand on that punch. Uh, so he was not suspended, although um, O'Brien said that he would have suspended him um had he if he hadn't have had to miss that time but consider the 20 game you know injury a suspension enough um there was also you know, as you mentioned before this was not coming off of the previous uh, 77 finals where there was that big Maurice Lucas Daryl Dawkins fight and a huge brawl that uh you know was in sort of an embarrassment to the league you know with millions watching um at, at home during that time so um so there's already you know a a a, even though it's celebrated on one hand, it's also, you know, the league is starting to um, penalize it more. And then we get to the punch itself. Um, December 9th, 1977. Um, it starts with Washington getting into a scuffle with the Rockets. Uh, Kevin Kunert, it's this game is in Los Angeles. Um, then 
Kareem Abdul Jabbar moves in, pins Kunitz's arms behind him, sort of really trying to pull him off, but sort of pinning the arms unintentionally. And then Washington struck Kunert. Then Tom Janovich runs over, and Washington turns around, strikes him in the face, causing a fractured skull, broken jaw, broken nose, and other facial in- injuries and leak- leaking of a spinal fluid as uh, Tom Janovich is, is nailed and, and lands his head on the floor. Uh, everyone's horrified by the scene. It's it described very well in the uh, punch uh, by uh, John Feinstein, which is a uh, a pretty a very good account of this and a pretty good account of the league at the time. And, and it was written in 2002, so it gets a lot into what Tom Janovich and Washington, you know, were going through in the 25 or so years after this uh, fight had occurred. Uh, obviously, you know, a, a horrifying event and a lot of consequences that happen, you know, uh, immediately afterward. Well, I mean, I, I think that it's even more important because of who the um, who the who the two major players are. So, on one hand, you've got uh, Kermit Washington, who a few months earlier is highlighted in Sports Illustrated as an enforcer. Um, he he looks the part. He's six foot eight, incredibly muscular. Um, he's strong, a big, strong dude. And um, Rudy Tomjanovich is, he's almost the same size, but he is, um, he's obviously white where Washington's black. And Tom Tomjanovich is, is very much seen as kind of this blue collar. Uh, he's basically seen at the time as David DeBuscher 2.0, um, a very hardworking, scrappy, uh, you know, kid from, from Michigan who relies on the bank shot and fights to get rebounds. And he's a, he's a good, a good player, but he, he may be, um, overachieves based on his physical talent. I mean, all these kind of code words that, that we often see attributed, especially to, to black and white players in the 1970s and 80s. Um, but that's, that's exactly who is, who's taking part in this. So the NBA couldn't have asked for a, a worse combination of, uh, of puncher and punchy on that, on that uh, night in December. Yeah, and it's interesting because you you look at their backgrounds, uh, Tim Johnvich and Washington, and they are remarkably similar, similar in so many ways in, in where they came from and the, their social economic situations and their um, and you know kind of when they came into the league and um, you know their accomplishments you know in college and I mean there's there there are many differences as well, but there are a lot of similarities in terms of how they work to get ahead and and, and Washington really did so much to um, you know, take, take kind of limited skills and, and build them into, you know, a very good NBA player um, as well. You, but but uh, that part of the story, and that story has been told you know, pretty extensively in, in the breaks of the game. We've gotten into it in um, previous podcasts as well. So it's, you know, we don't need to recount it all here, obviously. But, um, but it is interesting how much uh, similarities uh, they actually have if you look below the surface. Well, I think what happens then as well is not only is the punch bad, but also, you know, for whatever reason, catches a spark with the media that um, yes. that a lot of those other fights really hadn't. So rather than it being kind of okay, it's it's a one punch. Um, you know, this this player is injured. We're going to suspend. You know, Kermit Washington gets a ten thousand dollar fine and sixty day suspension, which was, I believe, at the time the longest in the league for an on court action. Um, so so. Washington suspended. Tom Jonovich is out, is out injured in the hospital. But then what happens is the mainstream media gets a hold of it. And so the New York Times ran an editorial talking about NBA violence and how bad it was. Walter Cronkite did a special investigation. Um, and then Saturday Night Live picks it up and really makes it a national phenomenon, uh, this, this story of, of the punch. Yeah, it's just it's it showed over and over and over again on that on that's on the show and it's shown over and over again on local newscasts and uh, I mean it, you know it's obviously I mean it's just the the level of violence in this one punch which you know, I I think everyone pretty much agrees you know, even Tom Donovich that you know Washington was you know responding in you know was not intending to you know go in and hurt Tom Donovich he was re- more reacting instinctively to someone coming behind him and um you know feeling like he he was going to be attacked. Um, so, um, so Tom Donovich is injured for five months, returns to play early in the 78, 79 season. As you mentioned, Washington is suspended for, uh, what, what it amounts to 26 games, which is by far the longest in NBA history at the time for an on-court action. No one had that I could find had been suspended for e- even more than five games. So it's still the sixth longest in NBA history. Um, 
and um, he was also traded to the Celtics just a, a couple weeks later. The the Lakers pretty much just abandoned him completely. Jack Hinkle was um, was completely uh, not interested in, in defending him. Their the Rockets filed a one point eight million dollar lawsuit against the Lakers for the loss of um, Tom Donovich's service. There was a trial uh, where both had to testify. Eventually, it was settled out of court. Um, and um, yeah, and then this, of course, this cloud hangs over both of them forever. They're both reminded of it constantly. Um, Washington is able to revive his career somewhat. You know, he goes to uh, he does pretty well in Boston. Then Boston, he, he gets traded to San Diego. Does pretty well there for a year. Then goes to Portland for compensation for Bill Walton's contract. And you know, it, he has to actually ends up being teammates with Kevin Cooner uh, twice during that time. And they both disagree on exactly what sparked the, the scuffle. You know, Washington says that Cooner you know, sort of punched him, and Cooner disagrees, says that he was just kind of shoving his hand away. And, you know, so there's been a long, many years of um, dispute between the two of them over what happened. And, you know, Cooner hates being dragged into it. And you know, everyone kind of hates being reminded about it. But it's the first thing that, you know, really they are talked about for the most part, even though Tom Janovich obviously has had a great coaching career. Um, and Kermit Washington, you know, had many years of doing great charity work, which he was lauded for until, unfortunately, this year, uh, where he was charged with diverting nearly half a million dollars in donations to his own benefit, and you know, and and, and you know that obviously uh, changes sort of the um, that clouds sort of his reputation uh, as well. But before that, had pretty much had a strong reputation as being a great guy and you know, who unfortunately you know kind of had this one incident you know um cloud his reputation and obviously the physical cost that time Janovich had to deal with and the still getting the attention for that up until really winning two championships as coaches the Rockets sort of you know changed that a little bit where he's certainly known for that but um you know for a long time just dealt with the shadow of that yeah, absolutely. And, and like you said, there, the legacy of the punch really surrounds both of them. And I think that uh, you mentioned John Feinstein's book, the, the Punch, and it he does a great job, I think, of teasing that out as how these two players' lives are intertwined and, and forever will be based on this one one incident, you know, at this point, 35 or almost 40 years ago. You know, there was even some, you know, talking about who was to blame for it. I mean, obviously, Washington's the guy who threw the punch, and he, and he is the primary culprit, but he's also part of this, you know, this this culture of fighting, part of this, you know, you have to respond, this, you know, mentality of, uh, you know, this, this, there's a certain level of, like, machismo in the sport, there's a certain level of, you know, you, got, you have to fight when you're confronted, you, you have to be a man, you can't, you, you can't back down, you have to, you know, defend your teammate, you know, all, all these different things, which, you know, some of these things are laudable, but, but when it, you know, then it obviously obviously escalates to a situation where Tom Dravich could have died if they hadn't really realized the serious nature right away or if he just hit him, you know, slightly differently. It would have been, you know, it could have been something where it was, you know, just a routine punch and could have been not been that serious or it could have been, you know, meant his death. So, you know, it creates a situation, you know, you're, you're a sliver away from either a, you know, outcome that's not so bad or an outcome that's even more uh, deadly serious. And it, I think that creates... Uh, you know, we touched a little bit already about how race sort of complicates this and how this informs the response. But I, I think it's really interesting. You know, David Stern talks about, you know, how, you know, we, we can't let these guys, you know, these big and with these bodies, you know, uh, you know, fights you know, to, to, to this dramatic effect, you know, and this created a situation where now the penalties for fighting were so were going to be much more dramatic. And it was a, attempting to sort of get the a lot of the fighting out of the league. And, it you know, it certainly seemed to reduce it. But really, you know, the the fighting you know, the, the 80s and 90s are still celebrated you almost as much for the fighting, I think, as the 70s are. You know, the YouTube clips are popular. You see, you know, once in a while you'll see these posts of, you know, oh, check out this fight of so-and-so guy and all that. And it's, it's certainly interesting to look at. And there's a, a visceral thrill in fighting, even if we know that violence is is, is bad. But you know, I, I wonder how much really the punch and the aftermath of it really changed that fighting culture in pro basketball and whether, you know, I mean, it, it, it seems to have kind of been legislated out of the game after the malice in the palace, but really was this a transformative moment or was it really just kind of a, you know, a well-known situation, but whether it really made that much of a difference in these attitudes in the NBA. I think that it, it, it's a transformative moment in that, um, yes, the fighting doesn't stop. The violence isn't curbed in the NBA. But I think that there's a level of awareness. And maybe, um, you know, again, I, I'm reading into this a little bit, but, but maybe the, 
the the people who are fighting are a little more hesitant to, to let it escalate or to um, you know to go beyond you know grabbing and and uh, that that throwing a punch you know and maybe there are people less less likely to to run and help out like Rudy T was doing in the in that fight. I, I so I think there's a ripple effect, but I don't think like you said it, it's clearly not. Um, legislated out of basketball, despite the fact that they try to increase fines and, and stiff penalties for, for fighting. Uh, but it, it certainly doesn't go away. And in the 1980s and 90s, of course, we still have fighting. And I think, like you said, the more the more transformed moment, at least as we stand today in basketball, is the malice in the palace. Because then I, I think that, um, that that fans and players and teams and the, the league executives realized just how – how much uh, a violent action like that could really just completely destroy the sport of pro basketball. So I, I think that it's it's transformative and important in, in raising awareness, but I don't think that the punch obviously ended violence in, in pro basketball. Right, yeah, I think it more changed the way that violence was legislated and regulated more than, you know, I mean, it, it, I, I'm sure it reduced... I'm sure people were thinking now of the penalties or what happened to um, Tom Janovich. Or, yeah, I'm, I'm sure it, it, it created some hesitation, but it didn't really change dramatically the way that the fighting is kind of celebrated by fans and, and, and the, the, those attitudes. The, the, those kind of, I guess, took more dramatic events and you know maybe somewhat of a generational shift to really um, be changed. But Sure, absolutely. Uh, anything else you want to uh, discuss before we go? No, I I don't think so. I think that that's a it's a it's again a fascinating topic. The the punch and uh and and had a tremendous impact on the game. Cool. Um, well, before we go, do you want to tell everyone a little bit about your book? Sure. Yeah. In uh, early 2017, Roman and Littlefield is set to publish uh, my book, um, Tall Tales and Short Shorts: Doctor J, Pistol Pete, and the Birth of the Modern NBA which looks at the NBA in the 1970s. And so it, it covers the NBA from roughly the retirement of Bill Russell in 1969 up until the, uh, the arrival of Magic Johnson and Larry Bird in the league in 1979. So, so that period, um, looking at some of the, the, the seasons, some of the best stories, some of the best players, uh, kind of you know, tracing the evolution of basketball. And there are uh, you know, definitely some, some information there about about the punt and how much it influenced the league at that time so so yeah definitely look out for it uh probably like i said early 2017 cool well, i'm looking forward to checking it out we can always use more uh books about the nba in the 70s there are some good ones but it's definitely uh, uh a, a topic worth exploring obviously we're doing so in this podcast as well and, and it's been a uh, a fun but exhausting effort to do so so i'm sure your your book was a a, a similar venture um, <laughs> absolutely so um, thanks, everyone, for checking us out. And uh, you can find us at harborproxism.com. You can leave us a rating and review on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you uh, listen to your podcast. We would greatly appreciate that. In fact, that let people know that we exist and that we are worth listening to. And uh, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook at Over and Back NBA. Uh, please leave, let us know what you think of the shows, if you're enjoying the series, and uh, what you'd like us to do in the future. So 